All right, so now we're going to start Unit 3, which is the Progressive Era, and we'll start off by talking about American imperialism. So let me present this. Okay, U.S. imperialism. So U.S. imperialism, this started in the later half of the 19th century, so the later half, so uh, the late 1800s. Um, now, before 1890... It was just the continental U.S. and Alaska. However, by 1917, the United States starts to become this global empire where they start to take over. Uh, they get, you know, involved in other countries. Um, so what happens is they start to acquire colonies around the world. Um, we also see the Roosevelt Corollary, um, the missionary diplomacy, and control of the Western Hemisphere. So... Roosevelt is kind of a main figure that we think of when we look at U.S. imperialism. Nationalist. Now, someone who is a nationalist is a person who uh, is, is all for their country. Okay, They believe the U.S. needed its own colonies to prove it is a worldwide power. It says the U.S. needed to be able to compete with other countries that had their own worldwide empire. Um, so at the time... Uh, we kind of look at this area, the European area, okay? Great Britain had all, already colonized a lot of Africa, um, so we'll talk more about that soon. All right, global military presence. What they wanted to do was they wanted to establish a military presence um, around the world. That's what global means. Uh, because they wanted to protect the U.S. interests. Uh, by having a global military or a global navy, you can control the seas, you can uh, control trade. It also uh, allows you to trade with faraway lands and protect the territories that you've invested in. So what happens is the United States establishes naval bases around the world. Between 1883 and 1890, nine steel-hulled battleships were built, and this is an example of one of the battleships, uh, prior or during that time. After 1890, the U.S. had the world's third largest naval fleet. And it's going to become even bigger uh, prior to World War II. All right. So we've talked about social Darwinism just a little bit. Um, social Darwinism, remember, this is the idea that uh, your race is superior to others. The U.S. during that time felt that their duty was to spread customs and religion, uh, their Christianity, to civilize other peoples. So we kind of get this idea. It's, it's called westernization. So the United States has always been looked at as western. Um, so if you look here, this is a, a political cartoon, and you see Uncle Sam... And you see some of these other countries, okay, and these children, right? So you see Cuba, Puerto Rico, and I think that says Hawaii. I can't read what this last one is. Uh, but these are children, right? And it looks like he's almost scolding them or he's trying to get on to them. But basically he's trying to get them to uh, become like these other children. Do you see this? Now, obviously we see some... Uh, evidence of racism here. Let's just point this out. Um, because do you notice what, well, that might be an African-American little girl back there, but I'm not sure. Um, it looks very, a uh, little bit racist. Okay. All right. Industrialization. So business owners start to look for new markets. Technology advancements help factories produce more goods. They wanted to use their ships to export goods to other countries, which means now they would be making money from these other countries. And they wanted to find cheaper raw materials to produce goods. Alaska. So, in 1867, William Seward... A uh, member of Congress proposed purchasing Alaska from Russia. 
It was nicknamed Seward's Folly. Excuse me. Or Seward's Icebox. If you notice, Alaska is pretty far away from the United States. It's on the very tip of Canada. Um, some of the resources that were found in Alaska, even though it was frozen, it was rich in natural resources like timber, which is wood, trees, okay, other minerals, and even oil. Oil was a really big resource. It was um, something that people fought for. We get into the Pacific expansion. In 1867, the United States claimed the Midway Islands. And then later in World War II, we'll actually see the Battle of Midway. <clears throat> Late 1800s, the U.S. wanted control of the Samoa Islands. In 1878, uh, they signed a treaty with the Polynesians, and it allowed a naval base at Pago Pago Harbor. If you look at the picture here, this is the Samoan Islands, right off the coast of Australia. Great Britain and Germany also wanted control. In 1899, three uh, countries signed an agreement to divide the Samoa Islands. <clears throat> we get into Hawaii. <coughs> so originally, Hawaii was actually a monarchy, which means they had a queen. They were also independent. They did not have anybody uh, under their, you know, over them at the time. However, in the 1790s, American merchants stopped there on the way to Asia. In 1820s, American missionaries moved to the Hawaiian Islands to spread their religion. Many of their children and grandchildren became sugar planters, who then sold sugar to the United States. The U.S. did not want foreign powers controlling the islands to continue the sugar trade. So they were worried that some other country would come and take this island away from the Hawaiians and start to control the sugar trade. In 1875, King Kalakua signed, so he signs the Reciprocity Treaty giving U.S. special privileges. The U.S. had sole use of Pearl Harbor. The U.S. would not tax imported Hawaiian sugar. So this was an, an agreement. Um, it was uh, basically like the Hawaiian Islands were kind of getting like a, uh, a benefit here. However, in 1887, the treaty was revised with new terms, and King Kalakaua signed it after immense pressure from the sugar planters. It says the U.S. was given permission to establish a naval base at Pearl Harbor, which was the best Hawaiian port. And eventually, we'll also see Pearl Harbor come up again in World War II as an attack uh, from the Japanese. King Kalakaua uh, agreed to amend the Hawaiian Kingdom's constitution. Only wealthy landowners could vote. Native Hawaiians no longer had a voice. In 1890, Congress passes the McKinley Tariff which raised prices on Hawaiian sugar. Um, this actually was a bad thing for the Hawaiian Islands because that meant that less Hawaiian sugar was sold. A tariff is usually a tax on something that's an import. Okay, so that means that any sugar coming from Hawaii into the United States was now more expensive. And so business owners in the United States would not purchase it because it was more expensive. That means that, the, uh, like we said, less Hawaiian sugar was sold, and it caused a depression on the islands. If the islands were annexed by the U.S., there was no tariff. So this was almost a way that they were kind of cutting them off. In 1891, King Kalakaua died, and his sister, Queen Lilo Kualani, took the throne. In 1887, they proposed removing the 1887 Amendment from the Constitution, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Hawaii for Hawaiians. They wanted to get rid of foreign powers on the islands, uh, but they removed the amendment, so that means that now <clears throat> everyone can vote. The sugar planters got aggravated and ordered a revolt. In 1893, planters asked the U.S. military for support to overthrow the Queen, and President Kroger Cleveland did not approve the Marines landing on the island. He said no. Oops. 
Um, what happens next? The queen is actually forced to abdicate or give up her throne. President Cleveland, however, wanted the queen to regain her throne. He was not for imperialism. Probably one of the um, better things that he's done during his presidency. Uh, this was not resolved until President Cleveland left office. Next, it says President William McKinley took office, and he was for the annexation of Hawaii. So, let me just repeat this. Cleveland, President Cleveland, did not want to take Hawaii from the Queen. McKinley, on the other hand, said yes, the United States should take Hawaii from the Queen. This is another political cartoon. <clears throat> All right, and now uh, enter the Hawaiian Kingdom. So in 1898, the U.S. entered war with Spain, <clears throat> and they needed uh, Pacific naval bases. So in August of 12th of 1898, the U.S. decided they were going to annex or take the Hawaiian Islands. They did not allow Native Hawaiians to vote on it, and it remained a territory until it became a state from the United States in 1959. So this shows an actual picture of the Hawaiian flag coming down before the United States flag was raised. Now we come into Cuba. So you probably heard of Cuba. Um, we'll talk about more about Cuba throughout this class. Um, we'll have to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis during the Cold War. So, um, Cuba is 90 miles south of the United States in the Caribbean Sea. So if you look here, Cuba, and then we have Florida. In 1854, they offered to buy Cuba from Spain, and they said no. <laughs> in 1898, Spain's colonial empire had weakened. Cuba began revolting against Spain since 1895. Cuba wanted to be their own country, and they did not want another country uh, colonizing them. United States had millions of dollars invested in the Cuban sugar industry. So if you look here, this is a picture of uh, Cuban citizens cutting sugar cane in Cuba in 1908. In 1896, Spanish General uh, Valeriano Weiler arrived in Cuba to put down a rebellion. Anyone who supported Cuban independence was then sent to a uh, concentration camp. Civilians were sent so they could not help the rebels. So the Spanish put many of these Cuban citizens in concentration camps. About 300,000 Cubans were sent to the camps. Thousands died from disease and starvation. American newspapers ran stories about the horrible treatment. And yellow journalists used sensational or exaggerated headlines to sell newspapers. Uh, and you're going to look a little bit further into yellow journalism in one of your activities. All right, Cuba. Often headlines were biased, and they were sometimes not based on facts, uh, which is kind of normal. Um, you see that a lot, especially in 2020. Some Americans supported the Cuban independence. However, businesses wanted Spain to retain control to protect their investments or their money. In February 9th, 1898, William Randolph Hearst published a stolen letter from the Spanish minister Enrique Dupe de Lome. In that letter, it criticized President McKinley. Or in the article, it criticized President McKinley. Americans were angered and they forced the Spanish government to apologize. Fifteen uh, of February, there was an explosion on the USS battleship Maine. This is a picture, um, obviously, you know, they didn't have a picture of the actual event. More than 250 American sailors were killed, and Americans eventually blamed Spain because it was in the Havana Harbor. April 9th, Spanish agreed to an armistice to end the camps. An armistice is like they're kind of, it's a draw. Um, they're kind of saying, hey, we'll stop. The yellow journalists, however, the people who started to put bias and um, misinformation in the media, blamed Spain and they actually wanted war. Americans yelled, remember the Maine. 
April 11th, President William McKinley asked Congress to approve using force in Cuba. And in April 25th, the U.S. declared war on Spain. It was the first media war, which means more happened in the newspapers than actually happened uh, physically. So now we get into the Spanish-American War. So the U.S. attacked Spain in the Pacific, first in the Philippines. If you look here, this is uh, right here. Theodore Roosevelt ordered Admiral George Dewey to get in striking position before war was even declared. On May 1st, there was an attack that was ordered. All right, so back to this. Sorry, we had a little hiccup there with my computer. So, um, after the attack was ordered, the wooden Spanish fleet, which was um, from Spain, was easily beaten at the Battle of Manila Bay. The capital of the Philippines, Manila, would not be taken until ground troops arrived three months later. All right, so the U.S. Navy's third most powerful in the world, um, the U.S. ground troops, no. So the Navy was powerful, the ground troops were not. The ground troops lacked adequate training, equipment, food, and they arrived in Cuba wearing wool clothes. Uh, you can imagine Cuba is very hot. Wool clothes are not really the best thing that you would want to wear. They were also outnumbered. The Spanish troops outnumbered the U.S. 7 to 2. So for every 7 men that the Spanish had, there were only 2 men of the United States. In June, the U.S. Navy helped by blocking the Spanish fleet across Cuba's uh, coast, and they trapped the Spanish, uh, Spain's Atlantic fleet. Ground troops approached Santiago slowly. So this is a picture here. U.S. troops arriving in Cuba. All right. Uh, during the Spanish-American War, there were 17,000 troops. Uh, there were actually four African-American regiments and uh, Teddy Roosevelt's group known as the Rough Riders. Um, this is kind of a picture of uh, William H. West. It says, Great Achievement, the Storming of San Juan Hill. So, uh, the Rough Rider, this was a volunteer regiment Roosevelt organized and trained. Typically, they rode horseback. In July 1st, uh, Roosevelt and Leonard Wood let Rough Riders and two African American regiments in charge up Kettle Hill, and they won. More troops charged nearby San Juan Hill and won. And on July 13th, Spain surrendered after their uh, naval fleet was destroyed. In July 25th, the U.S. invaded nearby Puerto Rico, which was easily taken. And on August 12th, there was an armistice where they basically waved the white flag and said, we're done. We're done fighting. So... In 1898, we get the Treaty of Paris, um, signed on December 10th. In this treaty, the U.S. officially received Guam and Puerto Rico. The U.S. paid Spain $20 million for the Philippines. Cuba became its own independent country, although the U.S. would control it well into the 20th century. Filipinos were upset with the treaty. They wanted independence from Spain, but eventually they were colonized by the United States. The U.S. did not grant them independence because they worried another country would come in and take over. President William McKinley thought that Filipinos needed to be Americanized. So they wanted to try to change their culture. And of course, then we get into a Philippine-American war. It began on February 4th in 1899. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, so we're just going to say Emilio Aguinaldo. Okay. Emilio Aguinaldo led a three-year rebellion during this American war, the Philippine-American war. Filipinos used what were known as guerrilla-style tactics. Guerrilla warfare is where you are kind of, um, I mean, you've seen it probably. Guerrilla warfare is when you try to blend in with the, uh, with the uh, forests and trees and things like that, you're not actually just on a battlefield. You are kind of, it's like you're hiding and you're attacking, uh, things like that. The U.S. then sent Filipinos to camps just so they could uh, aid rebel fighters, just like Spain did in Cuba. So these are concentration camps. 
In 1902, the United States considered the war was over. The last rebels weren't captured until 1906. There were a lot of casualties, 200,000 Filipino civilians plus 20,000 Filipino fighters. Only 4,000 Americans uh, were killed in the battle. So, in, uh, after the Philippine-American War, they created a new government system in the Philippines. Um, what happened is the United States president would then appoint a governor who would then appoint a upper house of legislation. Then the citizens would vote for a lower house of legislation. So it's kind of like during the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War. Um, this is the same thing. The king, you could, you could compare this to exactly what happened during the uh, 13 colonies when they were controlled by Great Britain. So again, the president has a governor, appoints a governor to rule over Cuba. The governor then appoints a upper house of legislation. And then the citizens are able to vote for certain people that they want into a lower house of legislation. This remained in place until the Philippines was granted independence in 1946. Anti-imperialists. These are people who lived in the United States who did not want the Americans to gain all of this territory and colonize different areas. They argued against imperialism. They said that the U.S. should not be gaining land when the U.S. government did not approve of European countries building empires. The point of the war, they felt, was to free Cuba from Spanish control, not to take over Cuba for themselves. In June 15th of 1898, there was an anti-imperialist uh, league that was formed. Members included in that league were prominent people known as William Jennings Bryan, Mark Twain, who you've probably heard of, former President Grover Cleveland, and Andrew Carnegie. They also opposed the annexation of the Philippines. They believe that it went against the founding principles of the U.S., that you can't rule people without their consent, which I firmly agree with. The League opened court cases to challenge the right to rule lands beyond the borders of the United States. The court rulings declared that some territories could become states, such as Alaska and Hawaii, and that some would not become states, the Philippines. So this is something that a lot of people have questioned. Puerto Rico, for example. Puerto Rico is still a U.S. territory, but it is not a U.S. state. Uh, people who live in Puerto Rico are technically also U.S. citizens. However, they are not allowed to vote in the United States presidential elections. The League ended after the 1898 Treaty of Paris was signed. This is another political cartoon. China. The United States worried European countries would end Chinese trade with the United States. At this point, China was independent with an emperor, but was controlled by other countries. After 1894, Great Britain, Russia, France, Japan, and Germany established colonial-like regions called spheres of influence. You may have heard about this in your world history class. Most of these were located on China's coast. So if you look... Around here, it shows the different shades and who controlled these areas. The U.S. Secretary of State, John Hay, worried that they would turn colonies, sorry, turn into colonies and prevent trade. In September 6th of 1899, Hay sent the open door notes to other countries asking for open door trade between the spheres of influence in the U.S., this was known as the Open Door Policy. Only Great Britain agreed, but Hayes said all agreed. Others did not want to look greedy, so they were forced to agree. Then the Open Door Policy went into effect. You see here this picture. Um, we have Uncle Sam again. And we have these other gentlemen here who look like they are representing the other countries that we just said. The title says, Putting His Foot Down. And it looks like he's kind of telling them what to do. So again, it, it shows the example 
of the United States forcing these other countries to agree to this open door policy. Again, in China, we have in uh, 1900 Chinese nationalists, again, nationalists are people who are very, they care a lot or greatly about their country. Um, they are all about, you know, what's happening in their country. They wanted the foreign powers out. They wanted them to leave. So you have a group called the Fists of Righteous Harmony who start to rebel. Um, they were nicknamed Boxers. This is a picture captured the Boxers. Uh, they attached, or sorry, that's supposed to be attacked, attacked foreigners and Chinese who had converted to Christianity. August of 1900, you have Japan, Great Britain, France, Germany, and the U.S. who send troops to end what is known as the Boxer Rebellion. So again, the Boxers rebelling against the control of foreign countries. China had to pay each country for damages. Hay sent more open, uh, open door notes to maintain open trade. The United States believed the growth of the U.S. American economy, I'm sorry, the American economy depended on exports. All right, so exports are things that you send out. Imports are things that come in. So the United States was making money off of things that they were sending to other countries. Other countries would buy their products. The United States believed it had the right to intervene internationally to keep foreign markets open. And then that says the open door policy remained in effect for over 40 years. Next we get into Japan. All right. In 1904, there was a war between Russia and Japan. President Teddy Roosevelt helped negotiate a peace treaty. The Japanese were unhappy with the treaty and anti-American feelings spread across Japan. There was also, they were very upset about the treatment of Japanese immigrants in California. If you remember, um, there was a, uh, the United States government was not, they didn't look kindly um, to Asian immigrants. Um, they'd created what was known as the Gentleman's Agreement in 1907 that appeased both countries. When you say appease, it means that you're satisfied. So it satisfied both countries. As the United States gained in Pacific Territory, tensions increased. In 1908, President Roosevelt signed the Root to Kira Agreement with Japan. The U.S. and Japan agreed to respect each other's territories in the Pacific, and Roosevelt believed this prevented a war with Japan. That is the end of... Sorry, I got cut off. That is the end of American imperialism notes. You will move on to the next notes.